I'm Nick Pettit. I'm Jason Seifer. And you're watching The Treehouse Show, your weekly dose of internets where we talk about all things web design, web development, and more. In this episode, we'll be talking about reactive programming, CSS spacing, image loading, and more. Let's check it out. First up is tidytime.js. This is a jQuery plugin that will transform times into, well, basically different formatting. So let's take a look at tidy time here. On the homepage, they say, hey dude, it's nine minutes to four and I'm feeling good. If we scroll down here, we can see a couple more examples of how it transforms a digital time into more of a friendly sentence. You can include tidy time in your website just after including jQuery. And then to instantiate the plugin, all you have to do is attach tidy time just like that after the DOM is loaded. And you can configure a couple options there and it will transform your times. It's pretty cool. Not a whole lot to say about it, but you know, normally this type of thing is actually done server side, but this is a really nice way to do it on the front end. I would like to express my disappointment. I got very excited when you said we could manipulate time. Not quite what you're thinking, yes. but I see where you're going with that. I was hoping for a time machine. I think we all are hoping for that. Next up, we have a project called Reactive.js. I, I think I'm pronouncing that right. Anyway, this is really interesting. This brings functional reactive programming to JavaScript. Well, what does that mean? I understood some of those words. <laughs> so essentially, what that means is if you have a variable, uh, with functional reactive programming, if that variable changes, you don't really need to do anything to update the code somewhere else. So if you have, say, a count of the number of dishes in the sink that your roommate didn't clean, I mean, they could just take five minutes to do it. Uh, if for some reason that increments, you don't have to change anything in the DOM. So if you take a look at the website right here, it says it's uh, HTML is an amazing language for creating static documents, but it wasn't really designed for interactive web apps. So when you use Reactive, you can use these templates right here. It says, hello user, you have messages dot unread. So then you instantiate a new Reactive object, give it the data that you need, and if the data changes at all, then it automatically updates in the code, uh, in the DOM, and you don't have to do a single thing. Uh, in order to change it. Now, there's obviously more examples and a really great API to work with. It's also extremely fast. So check that out in the show notes, which you can get to at youtube.com slash go treehouse, or in iTunes, search for us at the Treehouse Show. Pretty cool stuff. Well, next up, we have this cool little app that will allow you to wrap your app screenshots into, say, an iPhone or an iPad or any other type of device. This is typically pretty difficult to do in Photoshop. Well, not difficult, it's just very tedious and takes a lot of time, but this app does it for you. So if we take a look, you can see all the various devices laid out here. And when I hover over each one, it will give me examples of what that device will look like. Of course, your app will be displayed here on the screen. And when we go ahead and pick one of these devices, it will load up this interface where I can go ahead and drag and drop an image file here, or I can go ahead and click a button to upload. So I have a file here that's just a screenshot of the new Treehouse iPad app, which you can check out at teamtreehouse.com slash iPad. And it looks like this screenshot is not actually formatted to the, uh, the proper uh, aspect ratio here. So this isn't gonna look quite right, but I can go ahead and click Generate Product Mockup, and hey, look at that. Our, our iPad app is sideways and not even the right aspect ratio. <laughs> but you get the idea. Pretty cool. It's called Mock You Phone, and you can definitely uh, get into a lot of different uh, devices here. Pretty cool stuff. I am waiting for mockups with a toaster. It says you can request devices, so let's see if we can get some kitchen appliances in there. Perhaps a blender, you know, those uh, things up. Yeah, one of those, one of those nice silver ones. Sweet. Next up, the Google Web Tracing Framework has been released, otherwise known as WTF. Yeah, that's that's the acronym. Um, their words, not ours. So, what is WTF? 
This is, uh, Google says, it's rich tools for instrumenting, analyzing, and visualizing web apps. So if you have, uh, let's say, a game that you're developing in JavaScript, this is going to help you troubleshoot performance problems that you might have inside of the game. And there are just a ton of tools and a ton of things you can do inside. Let's, uh, let's take a look at it. So here is a quick screenshot of what you get in the app. So what does all of this mean? Well, it can go through and show you exactly what is happening, chunk all the way down into the code, and you can see where the repaints and where the different um, pain points are in the application. Uh, it's really wonderful. As you can see right here, you just click on it to enable it and then it will load a trace file. Now there's an example trace that they have right over here. Uh, it's saying warning results may be skewed. This is just a sample. Uh, and you actually get a timeline from when you click enable uh, all the way to when you disable or finish doing this query. So once you get this, you can zoom in and see exactly what is happening in the app. Uh, over on the right, it will tell you exactly what was called the total time it took uh, the user time it took, and how many times this was called. So this is at just an amazing set of tools to go through if you're developing these JavaScript uh, graphics-heavy web applications. And yeah, Google Web Tracing Framework. Incredible, incredible name. Yeah, yeah. It's, it's, it's actually really incredible stuff. I know the name is a little bit funny, but yeah. it's, it's really cool what Google has done here, especially you know, when you're developing games for the web. I mean, performance is always important, but with games, it's like priority A1. Yeah. Kind of like the steak sauce. Ooh, delicious. Not a sponsor of the show. Shame on them. Yeah. Next up is some browser logos from Paul Irish. Now, whenever you're making a, a web app, you might want to say like, hey, you know, you can do these things in these browsers. Maybe some features aren't supported in, say, older versions of Internet Explorer. And you need to show some nice browser logos to demonstrate you know, where the app support is. You need Netscape Navigator 4.0 or above to view this website. Exactly. Resolution needs to be 1024 by 768, and you need Flash. <laughs> right. No, uh, these high-res uh, high browser logos are pretty cool, but it can be difficult to find all of them or find the most current one, and you can mix things up pretty easily. So. This repo on GitHub is maintained to have the latest versions of all of the browser logos at high resolution, and it's pretty handy. They even have a few browsers in here that, honestly, I have never heard of before, but I guess I'll have to check those out. And if you scroll down, you even have My Little Pony versions of all the different browsers. Look at that. They have absolutely everything here. That's adorable. Hmm. Pretty cool stuff. <laughs> Next up, Nick, your app makes me fat. Really? Yeah. I'm this, so sorry about that. This is a blog post from Kathy Sierra talking about UI and what you have to consider when making your users do things on the web. So she starts off with a psychology experiment that was done where people were given two different tasks, right? Uh, one group has to remember two numbers and one group has to remember seven different numbers. Afterwards, they're offered a snack. Um, they could either choose something healthy like fruits and vegetables or cake. For the group that had to remember seven numbers, they were 50% more likely to choose the cake. Wow. So what does this have to do with web applications and UI? Well, the more that you ask your users to do, the more you're depleting their willpower. Hmm. So what you want to do is make your apps as simple as possible and don't make your users jump through all of these hoops when building your web applications. Make everything simple. Don't make them do a lot of things. You know, kind of things we talk about on this show. Make it as simple and good UI as possible. So That's really good advice. So yeah. actually, rather than going out, exercising, and eating healthy, it's better to sit around all day and just optimize our web apps and have no physical activity. 100%. I think that's the message here. For a little more background on that, check out the link to the blog post in the show notes. But yeah, Nick, you pretty much nailed it. Nice. Actually, it is a really cool blog post. Uh, I know I was making fun of it, but please do check it out. Yeah, no, it's, it's really good. So next up is a post from CSS Tricks by Chris Coyer about spacing at the bottom of modules. Well, what is a module? Chris Coyer describes it as a content-e and app-e type thing. And basically, it's just anytime you have uh, kind of a box like this on a web page. Now, the problem 
is the spacing in each one of these content modules. Right now, this box is all evenly padded and it just has some raw content or some raw text inside of it. But when you start adding a couple of different things inside of the module, such as a third level headline or a paragraph, you start to get uneven spacing. You can see down here at the bottom that there's some extra margin on the bottom of this paragraph. And here is actually a colored example to illustrate that even further. Now, you could do a couple of things here, and Chris walks through them. You could remove the margin on the paragraph. That's kind of messy. You could remove the margin on the last child of a paragraph. That's also not that great, though. Uh, what Chris actually suggests doing is to remove the margin on any last child inside of the element, and he even gives an example here where you can nest each last child element further. I'm not exactly sure how to phrase that. It's a little bit complicated, but uh, do check out the code. And there's even an example from CodePen here showing how that is reflected across several different types of elements inside of these modules. Pretty nifty technique, and it's actually a problem that when, you know, developing the CSS for an app, you're constantly removing the margin from the bottom of these stupid content boxes, and it's really a waste of time. So just applying this one catch-all uh, could save you a lot of time. Good work, Chris Coyer. Yeah, as usual. Uh, next up, we have a blog post by Patrick Kunka on taking control of image loading. He's been working on a lot of photographically heavy websites recently, and something that kind of winds up bothering him is when images don't completely load as you're scrolling down a page. You know, sometimes the browser hasn't fetched an entire image. Now, this is going to be for, like, you know, really big images. Um, you know, as, as we're doing with responsive and retina-heavy websites, the bigger images can be, you know, something to take into account. Definitely. He says that broadband has mitigated some of these problems, but it's still an issue that you want to take into account. Yeah. So how do you solve this? Well, he has four different solutions that he goes through in the blog post. Uh, the first one is pretty easy. Just wrap the element in a div. Um, this is for a single asset. Uh, wrap it in a div with a class of image wrapper, and this allows you to manipulate the image and the div uh, just a little bit differently. Um, you can constrain it to a 4-3 aspect ratio and um, put the image inside there with an absolute position and a width of 100%. Then he adds an onload attribute to the image tag, which lets you fire some JavaScript as soon as this is loaded. Now, one thing that he says is, hey, this, uh, you know, people are gonna really be a little bit offended at this. You really shouldn't be using inline attributes and inline JavaScript. And he says, well, for the most part, I agree with you, but every once in a while, I I'm not opposed to a solution if it works. And he says this does most of the time. Uh, the next solution that he presents is grouping multiple assets inside of a slideshow div. So uh, doing something like that, same thing. Um, one bigger div with a slideshow contains your three images. And then on load, you call the slide loaded function which finds the image and then adds and loads all of them in the background. Also, he has this little percent loaded variable, which will tell you how much the image has loaded so far. Um, that's that's going to be good for more of a slideshow where you have only a few images to load, but what else, like what do you do if you want to have more images on the page and preload them? Well, that's something else you can do. You can preload images beforehand. Uh, he has a JavaScript, uh, just a quick array of images and then preload those in the background. And finally, the last solution is going to be lazy loading images as you scroll down the page. And he has another solution in there as well. Uh, we're not going to go into that because this is getting a, a little bit heavy but I definitely recommend checking out that link. And if you want to check out lazy loading, just go to Pinterest. Oh yeah, there you go. Simple. Great example. All right. I am at Nick RP on Twitter. I am at Jay Cipher. For more information on anything we talked about, check out our show notes at youtube.com slash gotreehouse. And of course, if you'd like to see more videos like this one about web design, web development, business, and so much more, be sure to check us out at teamtreehouse.com. Thanks so much for watching, and we'll see you next week. Yeah.